look up to and when we have a question about things go hey so jack Ask to have the mobile system because if I have to stand here for an hour or stand any place for an hour, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, but just offhand, first want to thank Mark and Sean for the opportunity to come back. Am I good? Ah, perfect. Uh, I want to thank Sean and Mark for the opportunity to come back to, to San Antonio. I'm a native San Antonian. Um, any opportunity I get to come back, but probably bigger than that, um, really looking forward to seeing some of my ex-students, some of my ex-classmates. Some are retired, some are thinking about retiring, some have retired and David decided to come back. And so um, any opportunity to come back, uh, I appreciate it. The talk I'm gonna give today is basically looking at domains that all of us have been educated in, but in some cases we don't naturally put them together. There we go. And, um, you know, the, the, the funny story is, um, how do we get there and how did we get away from there? And I think one of the things that I have done throughout my career is I've always looked for opportunities. Um, the question is asked, how did you get to work at the Olympic Games? And basically it came from having really good mentors, having an opportunity open up and running towards it. And uh, my students know I tell them all the time, um, just go through life with your eyes wide open because there's opportunities out there all over the place. It's just a matter of taking advantage of them and running for them. And, and if you were to look at my resume now, as much as you would look at articles and things, I literally list my ex-students that have gone on to professional sports. I have 16 of my ex-students have gone to the Olympic Games as athletic trainers. And those are the things I'm proud about. But, you know, how did we get to this place? And in one way, I kind of feel like um, Christopher Columbus. You know, Christopher Columbus left not knowing where he was going. He arrived not knowing where he was at and went home not knowing where he'd been. And the point being is that you just go off on an adventure and sometimes you have to pull yourself out of that comfort zone. And we all have been through, and the point, the reason I'm giving this point is that we've all been educated. We have very similar educational backgrounds. It's where do we go from that base? Because that's just the foundation. And from there, you start to apply all of those academic domains. And this is just the classical domain when we look at rehabilitation. And in most cases, it's time dependent. And what I mean by time dependent is you all have a pretty good idea of the prognosis. Ankle sprain, gonna be out three to 10 days, depending upon the severity. If you're in the MBA, that translates into two to three weeks, um, simply because everything that we're doing is based off the time dependent and the pathology and how quickly can the tissue healing. We completely forget about all of those other attributes that are so important things such as the physical fitness of the athlete. And my talk today is just kind of bring that back. Again, you all have had an exercise science class. You all have had your therapy rehab class. You've had your pathology class. You've had of all this. And what I'm gonna to try to do today, hopefully, is kind of bring that together. And so rather than having your rehab plan based off the simple fact, and the previous speaker talked about it, is that you come in, the doctor releases the athlete, say you're good to go. Well, what did the doctor use to actually determine that? Uh -oh. There you go. They tend to use just basic standard testing. You can open up the Journal of Athletic Training. Some of the majority of the research today are these EBPs or evidence-based practice. And there's all kinds of different tests that have been validated to look at the actual outcome of a certain injury or a certain procedure. What is forgotten about that is that you're just not looking at the whole picture. You're looking at one little isolated part of it. The tissue's healed. The person's at the basic point where they can return to activity. That return to activity should have happened much earlier before the release. And I'll talk about that as we go on. 
when you look at, you know, again, exercise, physiology or exercise science, you all have had it. We've all learned about the energy systems. We all learned about the physiology of, of the muscular system. We've learned a little bit about training and periodization. When I took my exercise science class, we didn't talk about periodization. Now in the last 15 to 20 years, it's actually kind of come back. But the point I wanted to make is that it's not new. This has been around for over 50 years. You know, for some reason, people think that the, the Australians invented sports science, but they were actually the last person on the train. They just are bragging about it a lot more than most people. But when you look back, the majority of the early research in human performance started in the United States. And it started back in the early 60s, and it started when NASA started to come around. And these are some pictures of some of the top athletes, some of the top researchers that were actually back 50 years ago were already looking at physical performance. Um, I can remember when I took my exercise physiology class, my, uh, our main professor, Dr. Avan, checker, wouldn't let us do a max VO2 test because they didn't know what was going to happen. My running buddy and I worked out a deal with one of the graduate students. We kind of snuck in one day and we did our own max VO2. We didn't die, but even back you know, in the 70s, they weren't really sure what human performance could handle at that point. And kind of a funny picture, that's actually me up on the top, I guess to your right. Um, back in the old days, we used to collect the, the, uh, the expiratory gases in big giant weather balloon bags. And this was the only way we could do it, was driving around beside them with a golf cart or on a bike. Um, today, everything is so electronic that they can actually do the breath-by-breath -breath analysis with a little backpack on your back. What I wanted to talk about, though, is the point that we have <coughs> the capacity to evaluate very deep down into movement. And this is an example of one of the athletes that, uh, from one of our, my previous lab, that we had the integration of this Qualysys, this 3D motion capture system, and force plates. And we were able to put that together. Um, and this is a great example of one of the athletes that was just doing a very standard back and takeoff. I don't know if I have a pointer. I don't. If you were to look up at the top chart, you'll see that it shows the ankle movement, shows the, the knee, and it shows the hip. If you're looking at that 3D capture motion, and again, it will go down to almost 400 frames per second. But when you look at it, it looks pretty standard. When you look at the force displacement, it looks pretty standard. But when you can actually break it down and look at what's actually happening, we can see that the, the two of the joints are great in movement, but the third one, there's about a 20% deficit. This is the highest end of evaluation. But you can also see that there are very simple things that we can do. We were doing this 10 years ago, just looking at basic movement and looking at asymmetries between the bilateral side, its lateral side. And <clears throat> surprisingly enough, we had the capacity to determine if there were some predispositions that were in place. The problem is, in many cases, we didn't know what we were looking at. I mean, when you look at both of these scenarios, we're looking at one object, but you have two different outcomes. And I think that's a lot of times how we go through our career is that you have a, one picture, but you're seeing multiple options. That seemed right. And unfortunately, this is a little bit blurry, and not to pick on any of the Baylor folks, um, but the picture on your left is RG3 <coughs> at the scouting combines. And this was a picture that was taken, and you can see how the val valgus load is so prominent on him. Now, he was a world-class sprinter, world-class athlete. He was great. Um, and, and what I learned in professional sports is that these athletes are so gifted, so great, that they have this unbelievable capacity to compensate. So they have a deficiency that would catch somebody less experienced fairly quickly. But those professional athletes, those great athletes, are able to compensate. But ultimately, in time, it's going to catch them. And unfortunately, that picture on the right is RG3 tearing his ACL. Not to point any fingers at anybody at Baylor, 
I mean, obviously, if they knew this was a problem, they would have fixed it. But again, what picture are we looking at? <clears throat> and I think one of the most damaging things that we hear, and you all have heard it, and it makes my, what here I had fall out, is the simple fact that the statement's made, we've always done it that way. Well, why don't we think about this? Well, no, this is how we've always done it. And it works, and we won championships. To the point where, when I would walk into the Spurs practice facility, I felt that I was that cat. So where I walk in, I just felt, them. No, this is, this is gonna be a little tougher, but we're gonna work through it. We look at training and rehabilitation, <clears throat> and this is one of my bragging points. This is one of my ex-athletes. Um, he was a Nebraska football player. We called him the Boy Scout because this kid does, it's impressive. In four years as a walk-on at the University of Nebraska, he started, finished his undergraduate degree and a master's degree in electrical engineering, went off to bobsledding, and became a two-time Olympic medalist. Came back to Nebraska as one of my doctoral students, I was one of many. Um, and finished a bioengineering PhD in less than two years. But he was the one that came up with this, and so I wanted to attribute it to him. But looking at the, the process of training actually mimics the process of rehabilitation if we look at it deep enough and long enough. Uh, the simple fact that what we're trying to do is, is develop skill, we're trying to develop metabolic processes, and we're trying to do it in a sequential way that has the greatest outcome. And it's a matter of putting all of that together. <clears throat> this is just your basic periodization chart. And all of you have seen this. And essentially what it's looking at is you've got the technique, when you're gonna work, uh, emphasize skill, when you emphasize intensity, when you emphasize volume. And we all know this, volume starts first, you develop the base, then you start working on the intensity, and once the intensity, is at an acceptable level, then you start working on the skill. And those need to happen in that order. Any time that you deviate from that, volume's not high enough or intensity's too high, you're gonna start to run into problems. And these are just some of the simple terms that I, I think it's important to, if there's anything that you take away from this talk, is the idea of thinking that when an athlete is injured, they're in a detraining state. It basically means that they're unable to practice, they're unable to train. And so what is gonna happen at the moment that they're injured, there's not only the myriad and, and the, the cascade of all of the metabolic changes that are taking place, but the body is now starting to detrain. And it's really important to be able to understand what are the principles of training and what are the principles of um, basically degradation or loss of training. When you look at the, the simple chart we look at, back when I was an undergraduate, they, they told us then, we didn't exactly know why, but they said you just need to understand that for every day of inactivity is gonna act, actually take two days of rehab. We know now that varies greatly, bed rest versus active rest, um, there's a considerable difference. <clears throat> but what I think is important to understand is that you're going through this training cycle, the team's going through a training cycle, and an injury happens. This person is almost brought back to ground zero, particularly if there's a surgical procedure, um, or there's any length of time, two weeks plus, that they're unable to full train at full capacity. It's important to understand that that curve shifts to the right, and, and it's creating that picture. There's nothing linear about that curve. It is a curve for a reason. And just some of the factors that we, that we need to understand. Um, and these are all the things that you got taught in your undergrad classes that you forgot about. But I think the important thing to understand is that what is practice and what is rehabilitation and essentially being able and have the capacity, which you all do, to be able to, to monitor strength, to monitor range of motion, to be able to monitor power, endurance, and all of those things. But there are a whole lot of things taking place under the surface that we also have to be aware of. 
When you look at this, the rates of decay, the aerobic system, the anaerobic system, power, speed, maximal strength, these are all basic things that you were taught in your exercise science class. And if you continue to use these principles, I could probably ask you right now, how quickly do you lose strength? Or I could ask you, how quickly do you lose range of motion? And why do you lose those things? If you're not using those principles, probably what you're thinking in your head right now is that is based it off of time. And it talks about things when it comes to speed, power training, maintenance goes a long way. And the point being is that when an athlete is injured and they are limited in some capacity, range of motion, pain, strength, it is very important that you look at the big picture of all of the parameters of that actual athlete's um, charge, what is the, the essential loads that that athlete is gonna to have to experience once they return, what is the team experiencing? And being able to understand what the team's experiencing and extrapolate back to this athlete. I mean, it was something that we, we were puzzled with 20, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I can remember the days, and some of you can remember the days where Basically, they put, with an ACL, they would put it in a cast, believe it or not, a plaster cast, for almost two months. And they come out of that cast, and yes, the ligament was healed, but you've ruined a leg. And the thought early on was, how can we stimulate that other leg? And so they came up with all kinds of crazy ideas, working the uninjured leg, double hard, and so you'd get some transfer over, which occurs, but to a very minor amount. But what happened more than anything is that for an ACL, you created a really good set of tendonitis on that uninjured side. Um, and the point being is that until they figured out the fact that this ACL and this graft is almost like a rope and we don't need to cast it and we really don't need to brace it for very long, we started to realize that there are things that we could do early on to maintain some of those physiological capacities that wouldn't be compensated by the surgery. And so I can remember, um, I had the opportunity when I was on the West Coast to work with an NFL athlete. And the idea was that he tore his ACL. He was an all pro at the beginning of the season, very good team, Super Bowl champion team. What can we do to get him back? Cause he only had about two more years of his career. And so we started this rapid ACL 12 week program and it worked. Guy was back, he was at full capacity. Um, the one thing that didn't work out so well was the simple fact that back in those days they were taking a little notch of the patella and using that to sink the graft. Not thinking about the fact, what's that little notch gonna do to the patella? And, the, and unfortunately this athlete on national television fractured his patella and the two articles that had lined up that we're gonna shoot out about the rapid ACL program, they're still in the drawer. Um, but the point being is there's things that an athlete has the capacity to do. It was 10 years ago, um, somebody would come in with an ACL and within 24 hours, we'd have them on the bike and working on range of motion. We had them vertical. Um, and it, it wasn't, you know, I, yes, it felt bad for them. Mom felt really bad for their son that they're bringing in. We actually had, we would time the record of how long it would take that athlete after the workout to go from the athletic training room to the parking lot um, because they were not happy. And the world record, by the way, was 45 minutes to get from about 50 yards from the athletic training room outside the football facility out to the parking lot. But the point being is that we knew that we wouldn't compromise the graft working on range of motion. What was happening is a simple fact that we had a lot of inflammatory things going on that we're not jiving too well with the, the, the joint, pain was, was a problem. But what we realized, and what the athletes realized, that as we started to move that joint early, inflammation went down, metabolism started to return back to normal, and, and they came out it much quicker. To the point where we pretty much, um, and I was lucky to have very good surgeons, um, they'd have full range of motion within about a week. But there are many different things that you need to look at and think about when you're developing this rehab program. There's the foundational rehab principles that you're going to apply. But what I'm asking you to do is now think about what can we do on the physiological, the training side, 
to set this athlete up to when they do return, they're going to be in a better state of mind. They're going to be in a better physical state to be able to return to practice, be physically fit, and able to handle the loads that are placed upon. But these are many things that we're looking at. Again, I just threw out the idea of an ankle sprain seven to, seven to 10 days. As you all know, that could be two to 20 days or longer. Um, but the point being, when that person is not able to g compete or that athlete's not able to compete at full capacity of practice, what's taking place in their body? What's detraining? What's breaking down? And what are things that we need to think about that we need to um, stimulate prior to them being released to go back to activity? And just some simple things. I listed a whole bunch, but when you think about training age and chronological age, chronological age is just your actual age from the day of birth. Training age is the actual years that you spent training. And I think it's really important to understand that. We do know that for some of the aerobic sports, it takes almost 25 years to maximize your aerobic capacity in training. And that's why when you look at the top marathon runners, you look at the top cyclists, they're all in their mid-30s. And so it takes a very long time to create these metabolic changes, adapt to the loads that they're going to have to handle. But at the same time, those are going to be the resilient factors. When you look at training age, you know, they, the quality tends to hold on longer to the quality, and that's what I mean. Essentially, you're able to tolerate greater loads, your, your system is set up to have the capacity to accept greater loads, and so when they're set back, when you, the person has to rest, the ability for them to get back to normal is much easier with the longer training age versus the chronological age. Unfortunately, chronological age, you hit that about 40 year old and things start going downhill. Things don't rehabilitate, things don't rehab as easy for a 50 year old as they do for that 18 or 20 year old, which we all know. When we look at detraining, what are some of the things? We know that fairly quickly we lose flexibility, and you all know that. Um, endurance training is an interesting one. It talks about that you can lose almost 25% of that after just three to four weeks. Why is that important? Well, even when you look at power sports, such as a football, um, on a blank on sports. Baseball, you have intermittent bursts of very high maximal activity interspersed with some low level activity. And the important thing to remember is that when you are in recovery between those high intense bouts, it is your aerobic system that's allowing you to recover. And so the higher your aerobic system, the quicker you can recover and the quicker you can go back and do activities. And when I talked about the cat, that showed you the picture of the cat walking in front of all of the German shepherds, that's exactly how I felt when I went to our track coaches and tried to explain to the throwers, those 250 and 300 pound folks, that actually cardiovascular things would be very beneficial to them. And I gave them the explanation, stronger the aerobic system, the quicker you recover, the quicker you can do activity. And they looked at me like I was nuts. And, um, one person asked the question, he just looked at me and goes, Coach, I've been doing this for 20 years and I haven't needed any of that. And I was like, well, Coach, I think the problem lies in the fact you've only been coaching one, one year, you just did it 20 times over. And, and the fact being is that, where did I get this idea? Well, when you think about the, the bodybuilders back in the day, they always did cardio at the end of their workout. And what do you mean by cardio? Well, they just get on a bike. and. and it took me using that analogy to these throwers and big strong guys to realize the fact, okay, that may make sense. Because again, when you're doing high intensity bouts of exercise and that stops you between plays, your ability to recover from that high intensity workout is your aerobic system. And so the higher your aerobic system, the stronger the capacity of your aerobic system, the quicker you recover. And in reality, the quicker you can do more work. And it talks about how long does it take to develop fitness. Some of the things to realize is that, and again, you talked about this in your exercise physiology class, um, oxidative enzymes significantly drop after just two to three days of inactivity. 
I mean, that's a big deal. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is your athlete, within every two to three days, needs to do some aerobic type of activity. It could be complete cross training. It may be something where they have a lower extremity injury and you're doing the upper body exercise. Or vice versa. You have a shoulder injury, you put them, or shoulder surgery, they're on the bike. But it's really important to understand the simple fact that every two to three days, you have to stimulate the aerobic system just to maintain any level of that system. The glycolytic system, actually, glycolytic enzymes remain elevated for five to 10 days with inactivity. And so that point being is the fact that you don't have to worry about that right off the bat. But I think the part that's important to understand is that the neural system is activated and depressed almost immediately with an injury, as we all know. And so when you're looking at things such as central nervous system stimulation, proprio-stimulation, it's incredibly important that that is happening every single day. And that continues on. You know, I mentioned this. This is kind of a chart that I think probably many of you have seen. As we increase in strength, we know that when somebody starts a program, that the first four to six weeks, an athlete will be in there lifting, or you're in there lifting, and you know you're getting stronger because you're going up in weights. Um, but when you stand in front of the mirror, things don't look as impressive as you thought they would look. And the point being is that the changes in strength in the first four to six weeks are almost entirely neural. And so, again, I go back to that point that almost immediately with that injury, the neural system has to be stimulated in some controlled way um, to maintain it not to lose it. Um, because a lot of you, we do gait training. You know, we, we learned how to walk a long, long time ago. But now all of a sudden, we have to be retaught how to, to walk or run. And that point is that the neurological pattern, the motor ingram is already set up. It's just been dormant for a long period of time. And so you very succinctly need to stimulate that system to bring it back. And so it's doing gait training throwing mechanics in a very um, simplistic way in kind of a part to whole practice session. But it's really important to be able to um, stimulate, again, that system as soon as possible. And that may be something as simple with somebody that was in an ACL, that, that or an ACL rehab, that they're standing up within the first eight to 12 hours, and they're just doing waiting, unwaiting. Now, granted, they're it's gonna be under a whole lot of medication, and balance is not going to be the best of it. It's going to be suppressed by the medication. But just sitting there in a controlled environment, allowing them to wait and wait. Just stimulate that system to what any level you can. One other thing that's really important to understand is what is the demand of the activity that that athlete is participating in? And we're learning more and more about this all of the time. Um, when I first got to the MBA in like 2010, we had no clue what the physiological demands were for a basketball. They just went out and played. The athletes would tell you, how do you get in shape? I get in shape by playing. Um, but what we didn't know is the training that we were setting up, was it appropriate? Was it meeting the demands of the activity? And this is kind of a cool project that I was able to be part of. Uh, with Gatorade and what we set back is that we wanted to look at the demands of basketball at the high school level, at the college level, the professional level. Um, the reason being is that when I first was able to look at some of the, the parameters and, and the, the um, outcomes of many of the activities that we're doing a basketball game, I was blown away by the fact that a, a normal point guard playing about 35 minutes a game will run almost two miles during that game horizontally. That takes into no factor of the vertical component. Horizontally, Tony Parker runs almost two miles a game. The idea of getting Tony Parker to, to go out and run 100 yards is completely impossible. He won't do it. Um, but what I was able to do with him was I got him jazzed about going out for hikes. And he would go and hike for five, six, seven miles and just loved it. But the point being is that as the technology improved, the tracking systems improved, we were starting to get a much better picture of what the actual demand was for those 
um, particular sports. Again, we were only looking at the horizontal component. Who's the one that does the most work on the basketball court in a professional game? And the big guys under the basket. They do more work when you look at load, intensity, velocity, than any other player out there. And if you think about a basketball game, those are the least active people looking at them. Um, but when you look at the vertical component and when that comes into play, again, huge. And the point I'm trying to make is that you first have to understand what the demand of the activity that the athlete's gonna participate in before you're able to build a program. And we were able to, when I was in the early 2010, 2012, we had some very young players that were, I don't want to say impressionable, but we could just tell them to do it and they, they would do it. Um, and they set up a pattern to one of the best power forwards in the NBA typically will go out and go for a mile and a half to two mile jog during the summertime. Like to do it on the beach. I told him it'd be even cooler if he did it in the deep sand, does it in the deep sand. But the point being is that 10 years ago, we had no clue what the demand was. They just did it. The other thing to understand, and you all live this, is there's gonna be opportunities, there's windows where you can start to come in and introduce not only a new variable within your rehab program, but there's gonna be um, maybe something you can introduce to your whole entire team. Remember when I talked about that it takes about four to six weeks to develop any strength? I, I just love it when our, I can remember our strength coach many years ago, his head almost explode because the coach is talking about, well, the season's over, we got a bowl game in five weeks, coach, team's yours for three weeks, I want you to make them stronger than they've ever been before. It's physiologically impossible. Um, and he, it was like, he walked out of there and he goes, I'm just set up for fail. And he was right. You're not gonna gain any appreciable strength in four to six weeks, you can't. The body just physiologically won't adapt. And so the, in understanding that fact, if your idea is I wanna make my person stronger, you're gonna have to commit four to six weeks, minimally, to push strength. And when we look at the, the pyramid of training, we look at flexibility being the base, we look at strength being the next level up, above that is power, above that is speed. Obviously, the greater your range of motion, the greater the range of motion you can develop strength, the greater strength you can develop, the greater potential mathematically for power, and the more power you have equates to speed. But just understanding that pyramid, I think, will help go a long way when you sit down and you're building that rehab program or your doctor gives you a protocol. And that protocol, I promise you, in many cases, will not say anything about training the physiological system. What are we doing to get that person back to their sport? What you're getting, as I showed early on, is kind of a time-dependent rehab program that can work for any activity. And we, we do know. I mean, can you imagine a marathon runner going through an ACL program and they complete all of the, the corrective tests and they're able to go and run pain-free and then you say, okay, now let's go run a marathon. Can't happen. But that, if you think of that scenario, in many cases, that's what we're faced with. The simple fact that they have met all of the testing standards, all of those evidence-based practice goals are met but that athlete is unable to return to that activity safely because they ne have not met the metabolic capacity to return safely. And again, that differs with every single sport. And I think that's one of the most interesting things. And I think something that kind of got sparked a light in, in me was the fact that I always, I was very lucky to be around some really good coaches. And I would follow those coaches around and I would ask them, why did you do what you do? And I wasn't challenging them. I just wanted to know what they would do. I mean, I was around some coaches, distant coaches, like a guy, uh, coach named Joel Vigil. I'd spoken many times here in San Antonio, but he's kind of basically one of the top two or three distance coaches in the world. Every day I would follow him around. We'd go have coffee. I was like, coach, why did you do this? Because it didn't matter what happened during the season. His athletes were dialed in and they competed. And I think now his... Um, 
one of his students took over the program, and they won 54 NCAA Division II cross-country team championships. And it's just a program that's consistent. So I, I just followed him around. And it's like, why do you do what you do? Because I think in my mind, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with our training, is we're kind of a reductionist in nature. We look at an injury, and we reduce it down. We reduce it down to the body part, the knee. And we reduce a little bit further, and we go down to the ligament. And then some of us may even go a little bit deep, deeper, what's happened within the pathology? What's happening, what's denaturing within the tissue? And we just reduce it down. And literally it became the fact after about a year, this one coach just looked at me, he goes, Jack, I can't answer any more of your questions, but what I have done is he recommended me for a PhD program at the University of Mexico where he had gone. And again, this was 30 plus years ago, athletic trainers weren't getting their PhD. And I didn't get my PhD to advance myself anywhere um, within a position. I got my PhD because there were so many questions that I had that I just kept wanting the answers. And again, um, getting the PhD, I simply, it helped me gain a greater foundation to look at this big picture that I'm trying to explain. Because if we were to sit down as a group and talk about a rehabilitation program, and some folks are talking about the range of motion, and this is where we need to meet range of motion, this is where we need to meet strength, this is where we need to get, start challenging endurance, I would be looking at it from the picture, okay, what are we gonna do along the way that this athlete can do, that the team is doing, that's gonna advance them a little bit further down the road, so when they are officially released, they're not ready to go right back to sport, but they've set up the pattern metabolically to be able to do that. You know, and again, looking at the big picture, and this is a game a few years ago. This is when Stephon Curry was just a young pup. I think it was the second year, but he's playing the Spurs and went into double overtime. And I can remember sitting there going, they just killed him. They just killed him. And what unfortunately I think the team wasn't looking at, if you look at the time, they went into two overtimes, and Stephon Curry sat out six seconds in two NBA overtimes and a full game. And I walked away, the coaches walked away with, we've got to control him. He, he's just, he's a monster. We just can't control him. I looked at it as a fact, they just killed him. He's toast. And sure enough, you look at his production to the fact, it caught up to him about three games later. He played 38 minutes and took himself out of the game. And again, this is the final seven games of an NBA championship. Western Regional Championship, but it's a big deal. But not understanding the physical demands and not looking at the big picture and not having a plan set one of the greatest basketball players up in history for failure. Again, two overtime games in the AT&T Center. The air conditioning was working at that time, but never worked really well there. And he literally played for almost 60 minutes or 58 minutes straight through. And so I, what I talk about, when I talk to my students, it's like the, the questions are asked, and it's like, I don't know the answer right now, but let's just walk with me and let's try to figure this out. And, and fortunately and unfortunately, um, you know, you have those folks that are early adopters, you have the late adopters, you have those folks that are questionable, and then you have those folks that are gonna be questionable till the end of the day. Um, and you just have to deal with that. But I, I talk about, um, the athletes and the folks that are eyes are wide open. And I can tell, I can tell that. You all can tell that when you're sitting giving a lecture. Unfortunately, I can't see any eyes because I can't see more than about 20 feet and everybody has a mask on. But you look in the eyes of your students that you're lecturing to and you get immediate feedback. And some of my best students are those that just walk in, their eyes are wide open. And it's like, okay, what are we gonna do today? And you have those problems, problem solvers. One of the things that, again, it's like we've done it this way. One of the standards in the NBA to this day to bring an athlete back and how they judge to bring an athlete back is they go through a scenario of playing one-on-one -on -one, and then they play two-on-two, three-on-three, four-on-four, five-on-five. Um, and that just didn't seem to make sense to me physiologically 10 years ago. And so what we ended up doing was setting the load monitors on the athletes and what we found was that the highest intensity, 
the highest volume and the highest neural stimulation occurred on the one-on-ones. Lowest volume, lowest intensity, lowest um, central nervous system stimulation happened on the five by five. And I presented this to the uh, National Basketball Players, uh, National Basketball Athletic Trainers Association. They showed them straight out. We've got this backwards, guys. We've got the, you're, you're throwing them into the most intense, high volume, high stimulation activity first, and making the judgment based on the least active, the least intense, the least volume of the three. We need to flip flop this. And unfortunately, I only know about two teams that have done that. So when we look at the paradigm of training, and again, I go back to that, that idea. And we, we've all talked about in our, in our therapy rehab class, going part to whole training. And interestingly, I actually met one of the, the founders of this part to whole training paradigm. And he was a track coach I knew um, from the University of Oregon. And if you would ask him, what'd you do your dissertation on? Oh, I did it on fly fishing. And it's like, seriously, you really got a PhD just doing fly fishing? Learned it doing fly fishing. What I found out years later was he wrote the first premise to the part to whole practice. I mean, any of you that have tried to fly fish, it's a very complicated, complex activity. And what he found, again, back in the late 60s, early 70s, was that if you break that activity down into parts and train it as parts and then put it together, much quicker, much successful learning takes place as opposed to exposing them to the whole entire activity. When you look at load demands, again, I mentioned this, it's different from sport to sport. And I think that's something that uh, you need to take into consideration when you're in that return to play mode. I think it's one of the most enjoyable parts because first of all, you're gonna need to know the demands of that actual particular activity. Doesn't mean that you wrestled, but you're gonna have to understand what the demands are in building that athlete back, rehabilitating for their return to play. And you can see there's just different types of activities. But to me, that's one of the, the most interesting parts, enjoyable parts, is trying to figure out what the demands are of that sport. And so rather than looking at all of these different LESS and all of these Y excursion tests and all these other tests, that ever says, you know, that's it. I'm looking at from the, being able to measure the physical capacity for that athlete to return to their activity. And again, along the way, I think, and again, that's the most joyful, is you're testing that athlete along the way, and the athlete's testing themselves. You're exposing them to things in a very controlled environment that they're going to have to experience in an uncontrolled environment. If you can do that succinctly and, and, and slowly, progressively enough, it's going to be a little bit more successful, I think. I think a previous speaker talked about this. This goes back to our basic principles of therapeutic exercise. Point being is that in the very simplest terms, you start bilaterally stable, go bilaterally unstable, go single leg st stable, single leg unstable. And then the next level would be visual, postural, vestibular types of things. But again, just looking at these very basic principles, I know you all know these, um, but when you think of the picture of the rehabilitation program, how does that tie into the activity that the athlete's gonna do? I think baseball does a great progression through um, the throwing program that was been around for 20 plus years. I think they do a great system of training to where they're progressively loading the, the, the throwing mechanics and they're training the throwing mechanics with every little part. It's that part to whole concept. But again, you're working on the volume and then ultimately the intensity. And again, it's just balancing those things. If I was to ask you to sit down and just write down what you think we're in basketball season. What is the physiological demand? What is the demand of a basketball game? Hopefully, when you've created that picture, you're able to look back at the practice and understand the simple fact that you're practicing to meet those demands of the game. If not, then you're preparing your team to be able to compete at the highest level capacity. And it may not lead to greater injuries, but it's probably gonna lead to a little bit less success. So building a syst uh, systematic approach. When we look at the 
basic periodization. I think it's important to remember, if you remember that chart, that as volume goes up, intensity starts to come up. As intensity reaches about 50 to 70 percent, volume goes down. But at the same time, performance should be improving. And I think it's important to remember that when somebody is injured, that whole curve shifts to the right. And it shifts to the right, and that curve changes in relationship to the amount of time that the person's down. And what I mean by down is the inability to do any physical activity that mimics that sport. I don't mean down the fact that they're bed rest. That'd be the worst thing. Um, but when I say down, you're just working on basic range of motion, maybe some cardiovascular things. Um, but again, thinking about in the big picture, and when you're meeting with the coaches and you're meeting with whoever your performance team is or you're building the program, just think about that. When that athlete is injured, that curve shifts to the right. And then you're building back with the same principles as you originally developed. It's just now delayed a certain period of time. And again, this is, I kind of got ahead of myself. This is what I was talking about in the chart. And then understanding the simple fact that when you have a stimulus, dependent upon the intensity of the stimulus, will dictate how much time is necessary for recovery. And, you know, what, again, I'll go back to recovery. Why is recovery such a big deal? In, in all honesty, and the Europeans figured this out 20 years ago, that the things you're doing for recovery and restoration are just as important as what you're doing in the actual training. And what we realized was in the United States, we had some of the best athletes. We had some of the best coaches. We obviously have the best facilities in the world. We were able to train the athletes to no end, but we weren't any more successful than some of the smaller Scandinavian countries um, or some of the smaller countries, and why not? Because we didn't take into consideration what was happening between training. And what happens between training is where the adaptions take place. There's no adaptations at any metabolic level that's happening immediately when you're exercising. It happens in between. And so things that you're doing to allow the athlete to return back, recover quicker, restoration things such as nutritional or therapeutic things, allow the athletes to come back. And there are some teams that, you know, caught a clue about it. I was asked to apply for the medical sports medicine coordinator for the Spurs. I applied. And lo and behold, I was just about offered the position. And um, Mr. Holt asked, you know, Jack, how do you enjoy a Spurs game? And I was like, well, sir, I just have to be completely honest. I've never seen an NBA game in my life. Um, and here I was getting hired by one of the best NBA teams. And, uh, you know, then I just asked the question to Pop. It was like, why are you guys hiring me? I mean, it's cool. I appreciate it. And I think it's going to be fun. But why me? And he goes, well, you're understanding your restoration and um, recovery. And my research and things that I had done in track and field. Um, and the GM smirked up. He says, Jack, we understand basketball completely. What we need to do is cross-pollinate and learn from other people. And that's one of the things that makes the Spurs who the Spurs are, that they have that capacity to look across. And if things are working in another area, why wouldn't they work over here? I mean, the simplest thing that I explained one of our orthopedic doctors 30 years ago, when I proposed the idea of getting that ACL and getting vertical as fast as possible, and he was resistant, no way, ain't gonna happen, it's bad. And I said, well, doc, what happens when somebody has bypass surgery and they crack their chest? What is the first thing within the first 24 hours that they make that person do that they don't wanna do? And again, we just had bypass surgery and had the sternum cracked, sewn back together, they make them vertical, and they've done that forever. Why can't we do that for an ACL? You know, ah, give it a shot. If it screws up, it's your fault. Um, but the point is that um, there are things that if we look across to what other sports are doing, other activities are doing, I think it's going to make it's certainly a, a, a whole system and make us a whole a person as far as our skill set. Um, but we're going to learn something along the way. Again, when you look at the idea that you look at heavy resistance, you look at the aerobic capacity, you look at the strength capacity, if they're too close together, look how the strength and work capacity drops down. And that was a big thing that early on, back 10 years ago, uh, it is crazy the demands on an MBA 
player or a Major League Baseball player or a hockey player, they're playing four games in five days, could be in four different cities. So literally you're playing, I mean, they're doing it right now. You play, you fly, go to the hotel, you play, you fly. And as they told me when I first got hired, and I mentioned, I told them, I said, okay, this makes sense. You know, obviously the quicker we can recover and the more full we can recover as a team, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody has to play 82 games. But those who recover have the ability to go into the next game better and, and in a greater position to do well. And again, this is just that example that I, I mentioned. If you look at the, the training load, this is an athlete I had a few years ago. Um, she kind of had a double-edged sword. She um, tore ACL, um, but had a chronic shoulder. Her ACL was coming along great through the rehab, but what we realized, since we were emphasizing so much upper body stuff, that shoulder that had been bothering her but allowed her to play was now getting worse. And so the, the point was to go in and do a, a, a particular decision on that shoulder. And so this was an interesting one because we had actually two setbacks. But the point is that we just looked at where she needed to be and what we thought, where we thought she could be. And then we just built the program around that to have her meet the team. And this is, I know it's a really busy chart, but hopefully this is something that you're either writing down or you're thinking about when you sit down to plan that rehab program. You've got the rehab protocol already, but again, it's probably just time dependent or it's range of motion dependent. It's not fit dependent, if, the, if I can use that term. And these are things that you need to think about. What can I do in between to be able to put that athlete in a better position physiologically to return to their activity? And besides the simple fact that I'm jazzed to be back in San Antonio and I had my first real breakfast taco in almost four years, I know that's an everyday thing, but it's really, it was really cool. Um, I'm going to the Salt Lake as soon as I can. And so I had to throw their, their grill up. But, you know, the idea of just slow cooking it, just take your time, look at the big picture. The picture's gonna change. But I think if you understand what are the physiological demands of that activity, that sport that that athlete wants to participate in, and you use that as your scaffolding, then you just build the program up until you're able to meet that. And we thought this was cool. Um, I think I went over, but we have any questions? Good? Paul, give me a question, buddy. No, I'm just